Hey there, Ashley Health Things Entry.com. We've got a continuing series with Dr. Partridge, so I'll stop talking. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mark. Uh, you know, last time we uh, ended with a, a couple of uh, radiographs on uh, some common impactions of mesial angle and the distal angle. So now we're going to uh, start to get in uh, some more complicated cases, and this is the uh, uh, horizontal, completely horizontal mandibular uh, impaction, and it's uh, quite a challenge. We'll step up from what we saw the last time. And again, I always start these by uh, just in my mind's eye, I do a little quick survey. And as you can see, uh, the axis and the crown are not quite on the same uh, line, so there's a little twist in it. Uh, obviously, this is going to bind on the distal there because it's so badly impacted. And also, anything you have uh, deeply impacted when you want to note your landmarks, and you can see, you can see the in, uh, inferior alveolar nerve outline there. And as we showed on our anatomy, uh, slide much later on, or earlier on, there's always a little concavity behind the second molar, and you can see that's exactly where that crown is uh, is on that horizontal, and it's kind of locked in there and undercut, so that's going to be a little bit of a challenge to get that out of there. So uh, I usually start my first cut with an axial cut from uh, the, the uh, coronal aspect down to the end of the root tip there. Uh, again, you want to bisect the uh, the roots. Don't worry about bisecting the crown. You're, you're, you're your line of uh, section should be lined up with the bisecting the roots. And again, I make the outside of the section a little wider uh, so that you can get the instrument in there. I go about three-fourths of the way through to the interior to the, toward the lingual side. And you want the instrument to seat at the, about the bottom of the pulp chamber down there before you uh, try to uh, separate the two pieces. After I've separated the two pieces, I go ahead and try to take out that little distal piece, although you can see it's probably locked in there, probably not. But once in a while you get lucky and it'll come right out. But probably what you'll have to do is make this second incision, as you can see there. And notice that the bottom of this cut is much narrower than the top. Uh, that's so you can pull it out of there. Obviously, if you made it the bottom wider, like a pyramid, it's going to be locked in there. So make sure that the bottom of your cut is a lot narrower than the top. Then you can take out the, uh, that little portion of the crown on the distal root, and then elevate the distal root into that area, and then take it out. Then you're looking at the mesial part. Fortunately, there's a little bit of a uh, the follicle remaining down there. You can see that little shadow down there. You can get a little instrument down there and try to elevate it out of the, out of the socket since you've got the distal root. However, since I said it's in that uh, concavity there, it's pretty well undercut. You probably will not be able to get it out of there. So again, you'll have to do the third cut, which is the same sort of thing. Uh, you cut it down so that the bottom of the cut is narrower than the top so you can get that little piece of the crown out, and then you can lift the uh, uh, root into that area and extract it through that way. Here's just a little uh, artist graphic of how do you section that. I, I use the uh, crown or the root as kind of a guide for the burr. Lean the, it's kind of like a fence is on your tabletop saw. You lead, use, uh, lean the burr against that and use that to remove the bone and then dissect it like that. Again, you make the outside of the cut a little wider than the inside and then seat your instrument right about down close to the furc at the bottom of the uh, pulp of the floor. Now just to kind of review quickly the sequence, uh, first first piece I do is I take out that little uh, distal crown section, elevate that out of the area, and then uh, take the distal root and uh, remove that. Then once you got that out, then section out the mesial crown, lift that out, and then finally you take out the mesial uh, root that's way down at the bottom and elevate that. I'd also like to point out here uh, that when you section off part of the crown, uh, I don't know if you can see it real well on the, on the diagram, but there's still two or three millimeters of the uh, root extending above the alveolar crest. If, if you cut off the root tip flush with the alveolar crest, you have nothing to grab onto and you have nothing to indicate which way the roots are going. So whenever I section out a little piece of the crown above the, uh, above the bone, I always leave about two or three millimeters of the root sticking above, extending above the, the bone, crest of the bone so you have something to grab onto and indicate uh, which directions the roots are going. Again, we'll go through the sequence. So what is the bony preparation for this? Again, like I said, I just uh, lean the uh, burr against the crown and kind of follow it down as my guide or fence. Remove the bone on the buckle there. A little distal trough. Uh, now you've elevated the lingual flap, which uh, or the distal flap, there are lingual nerves back there. So it, you should not have any danger about uh, just making a little distal groove there hitting the lingual nerve because that's in the soft tissue. It's not in the bone there. And again, you always want to preserve this uh, bone on the distal the second molar there. And here's a flap. On, again, this is a Pell Gregory C. So uh, using a Pell Gregory C where the crown's buried down below the CEJ there, I always like to do that little anterior releasing flap. As you see, we got a nice exposure of that whole area that we're working on there. Uh, wide base, narrow top. Uh, I'd also like to uh, say another thing about uh, uh, closing. Uh, 
I don't like to have complete primary closure on the two socket itself. Uh, if there's a little opening over the two socket, it can bleed out better. You don't get so much uh, pressure in there, swelling. Uh, I think you get less infection. The patient's a lot more comfortable. That's been my experience. And I've talked to a number of other oral surgeons that do that too. So we don't do, do a primary coverage, or in other words, we don't hermetically seal the socket. We always leave a little opening there. In fact, I think about two or three months ago in Triple O, if you look through it, they had an article where they did, uh, I think it was 55 extractions, and uh, half were uh, uh, closed primarily, and the other half they left open. And the ones that were uh, left open, the immediate socket right over there, healed a lot better and they had a lot less pain. So I always leave just a little opening on the distal second molar so that socket is open. Uh, now here's one that's a little different from some of the large. The other ones we've seen so far have been kind of a cone-shaped root. And this one you can see it's a really a wide shaped root with a dye laceration. Presents a little uh, extra challenge there. Again, I do a quick survey on it. And you notice the width of the roots is much wider than the root, uh, width of the CEJ. So it's like the uh, proverbial upside of the pyramid. So the bottom of the base is a lot wider. It, it will not come out of that unless you do some sectioning. And so the first section, as always, I always uh, go through the roots, uh, or go actually through here. I like to leave the crown on. Some textbooks cut the crown off first thing, but then uh, you don't know which direction the roots are going. So I like to use the crown as a, as a uh, guide to tell me which uh, direction to section the roots. Take the distal root out, and what's going to happen here, probably you'll elevate the mesial, but as you can see that 90 degree turn on that uh, mesial root, that tooth will not come out straight out. It's going to make a 90 degree turn in right up on the, on the end of the distal part of the socket there. What I do is I elevate as far as I can and then I hold it real stably there and then I cut off part of the crown just about where this optional line is there and then take that part of the crown out and then the roots, you can elevate the root out the rest of the way. Again, here's the bone, bony preparation for that. Uh, just do your buckle trough, a little distal trough in there, preserve the bone there. And again, we're going to use this extended uh, uh, anterior releasing incision there. And again, if this is completely closed by uh, gingiva, at the time I'm doing the flap, a lot of times I'll either take the Dean scissors and cut off a little triangle there, or sometimes before I actually elevate the flap, I'll make my incisions and then make another little triangle incision and cut off a little bit of the perculum there so that when you close it, you've got a little open triangular space over the socket so the socket's not completely hermetically sealed. Okay, we've worked a lot on the uh, ma mandibular teeth. Now we're going to look at a uh, quick shot at a uh, maxillary tooth. Uh, you'll see a lot of these sometimes. This one, we're fortunate it's not actually in the science, but it's pretty close, so you have to be careful. And, of course, in your uh, informed concern, always uh, tell the patient there's a slight possibility that you may have a maxillary sinus opening. Again, I'll do a quick survey. And we're lucky here. These root shapes are, are kind of cone-shaped, so uh, it should come out once you get access to it. But notice that the crown and the root are a different axis, so that means it's going to have a curved path of extraction. Again, uh, you want to save the bone there. Here's your bony uh, relief here. You just do a little buckle uh, relief and a little distal trough. Now, a lot of times, uh, instead of using the handpiece, uh, you can use an osteotome and a mallet. In other words, a hammer and a chisel on these. Uh, the bone around these is very, very fragile, almost eggshell. A lot of times you can just flip it off with a real strong periosteal elevator. But uh, if you haven't used a mallet, it's, it, it works out pretty well. You can remove the bone over here. The other thing you can do with the uh, osteotome and the, and the, and the uh, mallet is uh, sometimes you can use it almost like an elevator. You can put it right in between those two teeth, give it a little uh, tap on there, you get a good, better purchase on it and elevate it out that way. So if you haven't used it, uh, you may have somebody who's had a mallet and osteotome and show you how to use it, but it's, it's a really a good instrument. Uh, the problem you have with the surgical burrs on these sometimes, you have to be real careful back there because if you don't use a good uh, burr guard, you can, uh, uh, you can abrade the cheek or the lip and things, so be real careful and use a handpiece on those posterior uh, uh, third molars back there. And again, here's the bony access, same sort of thing. Just uh, do a little bony trough there, take a little distal off there, and make sure that you preserve the bone. Uh, and here's the flap we do. Uh, I call it Pell Gregory C, although the Pell Gregory is usually uh, designated the mandibulars. Uh, I call it a C, although the classification one, two, three doesn't apply to, of course, the maxillary teeth. But again, do that releasing incision in there. Uh, you may want to cut off a little bit of the uh, perculum there if it's completely sealed, so you want to make sure some air and oxygen gets to that tooth after you've extracted it. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out here. On these impacted maxillary teeth, you rarely do you actually extract those occlusally. 
they usually come out from the facial aspect. And a lot of times if you can get a little purchase on this mesial buckle line angle, I'll use a, the pointed end of a molt number nine and just slip in there, elevate it out. Uh, sometimes you use a B point and get in there. Uh, sometimes you use the millers in there, but it will want to deliver probably to the facial. And when you have this releasing incision up here, you have a nice exposure to the facial bone when you get to it and, and release it. So that works out real well. Okay, I uh, will conclude those radiographs for today. I, I know a lot of these uh, diagrams I've shown to you are very simple and straightforward. It looks pretty easy. And as I tell my residents, there's not a tooth that I cannot extract from a two-dimensional radiograph. But uh, most of the teeth are three-dimensional in a dark hole in the back of your mouth covered with blood and saliva and a patient who's gagging and, uh, not par and only partially numb. So, uh, yeah, I have a lot of difficulty with these myself. And I know some of our uh, staff oral surgeons break out in a sweat once in a while. So uh, do not do not get discouraged. Uh, keep the faith. Follow the principles. Stick to it. And it'll make it a little bit easier for you and uh, hopefully expand your practice parameters and outpatient exodontia a little bit. Um, I, I think uh, we're going to close here with just a simple thing on closure. I know after you've laid the flap and a uh, little segue there. <laughs> uh, after you've laid the flap and sectioned the teeth and done all the bony stuff and you finally got the tooth out, you just want to stick a piece of gauze in there and get the patient out of there. But it really, uh, do not short change a surgical closure. A soft tissue is really critical for healing. As I say, uh, be kind to soft tissue and be kind to you. So make sure uh, all, all your surgical area is completely covered there. Uh, prepare your bony surfaces. If you use the handpiece on there, you may have a little rough burr on the edge of the alveolar crest there. So get your bone file out, smooth that off. A lot of times the maxillary third molars, particularly in older patients, it'll break off a little chunk of alveolar bone. You'll have a little sharp edge under there, so make sure there's no sharp edges. What I do to check it, I just lay the flap over the surgical area and then run my finger over the top of it. Do I feel any sharp things poking through the gum tissue there? And smooth it off real well. And then you want to line and secure your tissues. Make sure that the margins are, are all lined up well. Uh, the, the sulcus is up where it's supposed to be. It's not too low and it's not over the top of the crown of the tooth. And then the other thing uh, let's see here. All right, we just went down. There we go. Uh, the other thing, uh, sometimes on the maxillary teeth, if you're doing an impacted uh, uh, canine and a roof of the mouth, or sometimes just a malaligned bicuspid, I'll make a surgical stent because it's hard to keep a, a, a gauze dressing in the roof of the mouth for any length of time. I just use a alginate impression, do a quick vacuum uh, formed uh, surgical stent, and cut out the teeth. All you need is just the palatal part, and they can just snap it in there, leave it in there for about 12 hours to help stop the bleeding and keep some pressure on there so it doesn't bleed up and get a big uh, ecchymosis or hematoma underneath of the, of the palate there. So in those cases, you may want to make a surgical stent ahead of time. And suture selection. Of course, uh, we use a either plain gut or uh, chromic gut for a lot of things. If you're doing deep tissues, you want chromic gut or vicryl. Uh, plain gut's pretty good for surface lesions. If you're working with a skin or outside external surfaces, you probably want to use something a lot finer, a uh, 5-aught nylon or something like that. Okay, uh, we'll, uh, we'll cut it off for that for today. And next time we'll talk about some other subjects, about the case selections and some complications, uh, oral antral openings, and some, uh, and some final thoughts on that. So as always, this is kind of interactive, so we really do appreciate your comments or any requests that you have. All right, thanks, sir.